It's great to be back in this theater, and it's great to see so many nice people, so many interesting people, so many interesting data. You are big data. So look around. By the end of this talk, I want you to start dating. Big dating. My name is Egge van der Poel, and I'm a clinical data scientist at Erasmus Medical Center. That means I work with big data, whatever that may be. This is a buzzword that has been around for about 10 years now. And for most of you that have heard about it, you will think of something scary and vague and technological involving supercomputers. But for me, it's nothing like that. It's just me and my laptop doing analysis, improving healthcare. And I brought something with me to illustrate how I think about big data. And that's this little setup here. And this is actually a perfect summary of my talk. And that's why I'm saving it until the end. I first want to take you to the place where I first encountered big data, CERN, the European Center for Nuclear Research. And what you see here is the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, a big machine. And this is the place where the Higgs particle was found. And the Higgs particle deserves a TED talk by itself, so I will not go into details. I will only mention one thing. It gives other particles mass. And that's pretty cool, eh? Um, but wh what I do want to talk to you about is the experiment I worked on, ATLAS. ATLAS is a particle detector. And it serves to detect particles coming out of collisions. And I worked on ATLAS. I had the honor to be at ATLAS at the time when we were looking for the Higgs particle. And at, th at that time, we had to cope with 40 million collisions a second. And that's 60 terabytes a second. That's a lot of data. Actually, when you would store this amount of data, you would equal Facebook's daily data storage after 10 seconds. This was big data before business people started calling it big data. And this wasn't science for Mavericks working alone. This was science and collaboration at an unprecedented scale. And I realized quite quickly we need to have a certain approach to deal with this data. And luckily, my, my colleagues realized this much earlier than I did. And they set up a global system of computers that was able to deal with this data. So a selection of the data was distributed over a global network of computers so that people like myself, scientists from around the world, could work together, share the data, and work towards this common goal of finding the Higgs particle. And this is what I call big dating. For me, the most important tool coming out of particle physics, and the only way to tackle big data. And I want to bring this tool to healthcare. And we're not quite there yet. It's still me, myself, a laptop, and technical difficulties that I will not bore you with. I want to look at the bigger picture with you. I have a little boy, Abe. And in 30 years from now, when Abe is my age, I think the data volumes that I'm struggling with right now will seem like floppy disks to him. And I'm sure he will look at the way we deal with data right now and might have some, quite, some, some questions about it. Because, uh, for instance, how, do, how did companies like Google and Facebook make money? And I would say, well, I was using the platform and well, they built profiles out of me and they sold this profile to other companies. And he might ask, well, what did you get in return? Well, I was using their platform, that was it. And, oh yeah, I got some tailored ads, tailored. You know, annoying baby stuff that I wasn't going to buy anyway. Uh, okay, um, but were you at least able to control the data and were you, could you say they sh should stop with analyzing your data? No, nothing like that, right? We have no idea what they're doing with our data. And I think when he's looking back, he would say that some of the smartest people in the world right now are trying to get people like myself clicking a button. And if he asks me what I did back then, what I did with data, 
I want to have something nice to tell him. And nothing scary and vague, but something very specific. Maybe something like this. This is Harriet. She's a 60-year-old patient in our hospital. She was diagnosed with laryngeal cancer. And for those of you that don't know this, this is bad news. Most of the, the fun part of life is it involves uh, tasting, smelling, breathing, uh, swallowing. And it all gets affected if you have laryngeal cancer. And on top of that, 50% of people with this diagnosis are dead after five years. So this is really bad news. And Harriet is now undergoing treatment. And six months in her treatment, she's experiencing quite some discomfort and pain. And Harriet wants to know two things. Is this strange? And what can I expect? So in our hospital, we ask the, pa the patients to fill in questionnaires on a regular basis. And we want to help Harriet with her questions right now. So we look at her results from the questionnaires, but it's impossible to answer her question whether she's strange and what she can expect. To answer these questions at this point, we have to look at scientific medical studies. But these scientific medical studies have two major drawbacks for Harriet. First of all, to be part of such a scientific study, you have to pass stringent selection criteria. You have to be of a certain age category, certain sex, you should be free of other diseases. And Harriet just so happens to be the wrong sex, the wrong age, and she also has diabetes. Tough luck, right? So the medical study is not representative for Harriet. In fact, a typical medical study is only representative for 0.1% of the population. So what does that mean? Out of every thousand patients the doctor sees, only one could have been in a medical study that they based their decision on. So what about the other 999, eh? The second major drawback for Harriet is the fact that it's hard to keep up with reality for scientific studies. Typically, it takes about 10 to 15 years for an insight from a medical study to reach a clinical patient. If you add to that the fact that after 15 years, 50% of medical knowledge is outdated, you come to the conclusion that by the time an insight reaches the patient, it has a 50% chance to be outdated already. And I think we can do better. Especially since there are many others like Harriet. Many other women have been diagnosed with laryngeal cancer in our hospital. And many other women have filled in questionnaires. And with these questionnaires and with the results from these women, we can help Harriet answer her questions. We can unlock the information that is already present in our systems to answer her questions about whether she's strange and what she can expect. And I call this unlocking the clinical intelligence. And that's what I'm working on. That's what drives me. And I'm not only doing this for Harriet, I'm only also doing this for the doctors, because there's not a single good doctor out there that doesn't feel insecure every now and then, that doesn't doubt whether they made the right decision and gave the best advice. And what I want to do is to provide both patient and doctor with the best evidence at the right time to support their decisions. And for this, I need data. Pretty obvious, right? Unfortunately not. Let me give you an example. In the Netherlands, we are quite good at healthcare administration. Actually, most healthcare professionals consider this a big burden. I want to turn this burden into a blessing. And I wanted to demonstrate this by studying myself. I'm a data scientist. So I went to the central database in the Netherlands with financial administrations from healthcare. There's one place in the Netherlands where all financial information is stored. So all my dental records, all my physiotherapy records, all my GP records, everything that has been built is there. So I contacted them and asked them about, well, my data, as I consider it. So I asked them about all the records they have about me. And they replied, you cannot have this. This is not your data. 
So how can they refuse? What's behind this refusal? Is it privacy concerns? Well, how can it be? Because it's me asking about data about me. I think there's something fundamentally wrong with the system if a patient cannot access his or her own data, data about themselves. I think people are too afraid to make mistakes, and that blocks us from reaching our common goal, which should be our common goal. And too often in healthcare, we're not working together. And I would like to paraphrase John Lennon, that healthcare is what happens to you while you're making treatment plans. It's about the personal touch. And if you lose sight of the personal touch, we're not working together, we're not sharing data, and there's no common goal. Therefore, there's no big dating. But we can change this. Because when I think about the future of healthcare, I can imagine a future without hospitals, insurers, but I cannot imagine a future without patients. So when I think about the future of data and healthcare, I think we need to put the patients into control. I think patients have to decide who can access their data, and I think patients need to decide who can do what with their data. And it needs to be transparent to the patient what they're doing with it, so that the patients can see how valuable their data is. Because just as the other women can help Harriet, so can we help others. I'm confident that if we would use all your data we can help at least one person in this theater. And it could be the person sitting next to you, it could be you. We don't know yet. And that brings me back to the setup. In 1964, two scientists from Bell Labs, New Jersey, on the east coast of the USA, were working on a setup just like this. Um, well, their, their horn antenna was a bit bigger. Uh, you, see, you can see it in the picture behind me. These were Arno Penzias and Robert Woodrow Wilson. And they were working on a setup like this, and with their antenna they were pointing at a balloon in the atmosphere and trying to pick up signals echoing back from the balloon. But they had this problem. They were registering a lot of noise. So day and night, and what, in, what in whatever direction they were looking at, they picked up noise, and it drove them nuts. What they didn't know was that at that exact time, only 40 miles westwards of them, so an hour drive from them, there were people actually looking for this noise. Because three theoretical scientists were writing a paper on how people should be looking for evidence of the Big Bang. They wrote, if the Big Bang occurred, there should still be some faint remnant signal that we should be able to pick up. And this signal should be from every direction, Day and night, well, you kind of get the idea, right? A mutual friend put these two groups together, and 14 years later, these guys won a Nobel Prize in physics for the discovery of cosmic microwave background. What I learned from this is, what's noise to one can be signal for another. But you can only discover this by collaborating. So next time you or your loved ones visit a doctor, make sure you start big dating. Don't wait for the system to change. Change the system. Let's go. <laughs>